Look at this excerpt from the documentary Cheney's Law that was broadcast on Frontline last week. Cheney had learned some hard lessons early in his political career. He has been watching presidents for three decades. It began at the end of the Nixon administration. 33-year-old Dick Cheney saw it firsthand. He viewed the searing moments of the Nixon administration, which he was there at the, in the front seats for, as a diminution of what the president ought to be. Then in 1975, he became President Ford's chief of staff. Dick Cheney was then about in his mid-30s, for the first time in his life, really having a substantial amount of power and, and, and responsibility. Subcommittee will come to Alden Council. Cheney watched Congress assert its authority over the president. You have a wave of congressional investigations. The program certainly appears to violate the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. And Five Cheney is trying to fight off these investigations. He's talked about how Congress unduly burdened the president and in a, in a way that he believed was unconstitutional. I believe that that's the way the and Dick came out of that absolutely committed to the idea of restoring the powers of the presidency. When the terrorists struck on 9-11, Dick Cheney was vice president with the opportunity now to claim extraordinary power in the name of national security. The Frontline documentary showed how he did it. They began to spy on Americans in an unprecedented way, in a way that they never had done before, by creating a special program to uh, eavesdrop on Americans without warrants on their international phone calls, and also by mounting a massive data mining operation. <laughs> The data from billions of telephone calls and emails were being captured by the National Security Agency. But in the 1970s, Congress had prohibited such activities without the approval of a special court. The initial justification legally comes from yet another memo by John Yoo, in which he says that Congress may no more regulate the president's gathering of intelligence against enemies, then it can decide where he deploys troops on the battlefield. If it's part of the president's power as a constitutional matter to gather intelligence, including intercepting communications, then that's a power that's included and Congress can't seize it just because it wants to. The program was top secret when Jack Goldsmith decided to review it. It's the most important thing during my time in government, and it is central to the government's counterterrorism policy, so the stakes are enormous. The stakes are still enormous, and the argument over presidential power has grown more contentious because Democrats in control of Congress keep calling administration officials to testify only to be rebuffed by claims of executive privilege. And has asked me to... Uh, follow the president's assertion of executive privilege. I was a deputy assistant to the president. I was a commissioned officer. I took an oath, uh, and I take that oath uh, uh, to the president very seriously. No, the oath says that you take an oath to uphold and protect the Constitution of the United States. That is your paramount mm -hmm. duty. I know the president refers to the government as being his government. It's not. It's the government of the people of America. At recent Senate hearings over the president's nominee for attorney general, Michael McKenzie, the battle over presidential power flared again. Can a president authorize illegal conduct? Can the president author can the president put somebody above the law by authorizing illegal conduct? The only way for me to respond to that in the abstract is to say that if by illegal you mean contrary to a statute, but within the, the authority of the president to defend the country, the president is not putting somebody above the law. The president is putting somebody within the law. Can the president put somebody above the law? No, the president doesn't stand above the law. But the law emphatically includes the Constitution. It starts with the Constitution. We'll go back to uh, we'll go back to this. I'm I'm troubled by your answer. I'm, I see a a loophole big enough to drive a truck through. The question now: Who defines torture? So, is waterboarding constitutional? I don't know what's involved in the technique. If it, if waterboarding is is torture, 
torture is not constitutional. If waterboarding is constitutional, is a massive hedge. No, I said if it's torture. I'm sorry, I said if it's torture. If water, if it's torture, that's a massive hedge. I mean, it either is or it isn't. Do you have an opinion on whether waterboarding, which is the practice of putting somebody in a reclining position, strapping them down, putting cloth over their faces, and pouring water over the cloth to simulate the feeling of drowning, is that constitutional? If it amounts to torture, it is not constitutional. I'm very disappointed in that answer. I think it is purely semantic. Sorry. But listen to this voice from the past, from 1974. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Watergate scandals had revealed astonishing crimes and secret abuses of power by President Nixon and the men around him. The House Judiciary Committee was deliberating Nixon's impeachment. Congresswoman Barbara Jordan of Texas went straight to the heart of the matter. My faith in the Constitution is whole, it is complete, it is total. And I am not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution.